Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Uma Alka. I'm a faculty member here at the law school. Um, very glad to be asked by the journal to uh, moderate the uh, first panel of the morning. Um, I'll introduce each of the speakers um, in, in sequence, and if you could just hold your applause at the end of that, um, the process will be uh, each of them will have a chance to speak, and then we will save some time, some time afterwards for questions. Um, and we would welcome you, Dr. Green and, and Professor Nolan, if you would like to join in responses for that um, as well. That would be um, absolutely welcome. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome to KU today uh, Professor K.K. Dufibier. She comes to us from the University of Denver um, Stern College of Law, where she has distinguished herself uh, both in the variety and depth of her contributions. Um, she teaches a wide variety of natural resource topics, um, including energy law, environmental law, mining law, local government law, all um, highly relevant to the themes of today's uh, symposium. Um, from 2009 and 10, she directed the, uh, her law school's uh, environmental and natural resource law program, and her dedication to the profession has also been manifest in a range of positions that she has um, held in a service capacity for uh, Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Foundation, American Bar Association, in the areas of natural resources. Um, so uh, she, one important thing to, to be aware of is the publication of her um, Renewable Energy Reader, focused specifically on renewable energy, published in 2011, which was uh, a tremendous contribution for those of us studying in, in that area. So a welcome to Professor Dean Vivier. Um, also very pleased to be uh, here to introduce Professor David Pierce of Washburn School of Law. He is a nationally renowned authority on the field of oil and gas law in the United States. And thanks to Professor Pierce, we have a range of critical resources for the study and practice of oil and gas law. Um, he has written the Kansas Oil and Gas Handbook. He's co-authored uh, a casebook on oil and gas and maintains a major treatise um, on the subject uh, that's uh, very important for practitioners and academics alike. Um, he's the past president of the Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Foundation. Um, he directs Washburn's Oil and Gas Law Center, and we're very happy to have him uh, here in Lawrence today. Um, and finally, I'm ex exceedingly pleased to introduce Wes Jackson, the president of the Salina, Kansas-based uh, Land Institute. Um, the Land Institute, as you will learn today, if you're not familiar with it yet, is dedicated to advancing uh, what he has termed natural systems agriculture. Uh, with an MA in botany from the University of Kansas and a PhD uh, in genetics from North Carolina State University. Um, he is the author of several books, um, including most recently Nature as a Measure, and he is just a respected leader um, in the international movement for sustainable uh, agriculture. Um, he has uh, uh, been recognized in myriad ways and valued as in his role uh, here in Kansas um, and elsewhere. So, Without further ado, I would like to introduce um, K.K. Duvivier, but please welcome the entire panel. Thank you. Anybody wants backup on this data, I can get that for you. But, um, 
This is from the National Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado. And um, if you look at it, renewable electricity capacity has um, more than doubled worldwide since 2000. So a lot of growth in renewable electricity capacity. Um, and specifically, 28% of that was uh, wind had increased 28% in 2012 alone, and solar had increased 83% in 2012. So you can see that a lot of these are growing significantly in the last year. Worldwide, wind is one of the, the fastest growing. It had worldwide increased 16%, but in the United States, 25% over that period. So. And wind accounted for 75% of the new installed US electricity capacity in 2012. So a lot of growth in wind. Um, it's still not a big part of the whole US electric mix, though, if you look at it. So here's the, the whole US. And, and the difference between capacity and generation is that you build the plants, but they're not working 24-7. So the capacity may be that you have 14% uh, renewable, but they're only producing actually about 12.4%. Another reason is not just that they aren't producing, but is that the utilities have certain plants that run all the time, their base load, and so they don't like to turn those on and off. So you might notice that nuclear is only 9.2% capacity, but it produced almost twice that much of the electricity because they're not ramping that nuclear power plant up and down. So the actual amount that they, the percentage that they generated is beyond what they are as far as built out capacity. But as far as capacity, wind's only 5.1%. So it's about the same capacity as petroleum in the United States. So they, some people actually do burn petroleum products for electricity. <coughs> but this tells the story of wind, right? That almost nothing in 2000 and huge growth over the, that time period. <coughs> And we're ahead of most production. Both the US and China are ahead of what people projected for wind. And then there have been studies. This one is from the National Renewable Energy Lab about an 80% renewable energy portfolio in the United States. So saying that 80% of United States electricity could come from renewable sources. And in all of their scenarios, wind is a major component of trying to figure that out. Okay, so let's look at where different states stand with respect to wind. <clears throat> Kansas just got into the top 10 this year, and it beat out Colorado. So Kansas wasn't in the top 10, but Kansas uh, installed a lot of wind in 2012. I'll show you the actual numbers in a minute. So Texas has been number one for a long time. California has been number two for a long time. Iowa's been up there, but there's a lot of movement in these uh, other states in the top 10. So Kansas is up there in the top 10. Why is Kansas in the top 10? Well, if you're thinking this uh, session is about uh, opportunities in rural Kansas or rural America, if you look at these maps from the National Renewable Energy Lab, you look at, okay, what about biopower? Well, actually, Kansas is pretty good on that, right? Because you can grow corn, and most people are doing ethanol. Um, but also you can do switchgrass and other crops. Uh, what about solar? And this is concentrating <coughs> solar power, so that's the solar thermal and large uh, power plants. Kansas isn't, oops, Kansas, I didn't put a circle there because, you know, most of those areas you may have been hearing out of the Mojave Desert is where you get the best resources for concentrating solar. What about geothermal? Kansas isn't too good for that because I was a geologist before law school. You guys, you know, and I grew up in near the St. Louis area. We were in the middle of a great big basin, right? So most of the rocks here are sedimentary or and they're sandstones, limestone. You're going to get the geothermal by the more volcanic areas, right? So we don't have a lot of uh, geothermal in Kansas. Hydropower, we don't have a whole lot of, of water compared to the, you know, the Northwest. Solar PV, actually, Kansas has better than Germany, and Germany is number one in the world, but compared to other states in the U.S., the photovoltaic, which is uh, solar converting to electricity immediately on your roof. But as far as wind is concerned, you can see Kansas is pretty well located there. So that's another one. So basically, biopower and wind are the two best renewable resources you're going to be getting in Kansas. And again, I just gave this for this web page. It's a great resource from the 
uh, Energy Information Administration. It shows the current uh, amount of wind capacity in each state. It also has a graphic that shows the, the development of each of those states. But here's the map that, that I find uh, most valuable is that this is the wind resource map. And if you're getting, we actually don't have any blue or red inland along the coast we do. But as far as inland, these purples mean that it's really good. And you can see that Kansas is right in this wind belt. And my daughter's an atmospheric scientist, so I won't try to explain why the winds are better there, but we all know it's pretty windy around here. <laughs> windy in Eastern Colorado. Um, so here's Kansas specifically, and you can see that the western part of the state is where some of the better wind resources are going to be. But here's a map that I actually find most valuable. That's from the American Wind Energy Association. Here's, you know, basically outlined Kansas. If you look at it, um, Kansas is number nine in the whole US with the amount of cumulative installed wind capacity. And about more than half of that was installed in 2012 alone. So 113% growth since last year. And that's why, why Kansas pushed itself up into the top 10. So, you know, number, number nine as far as installed capacity. But here's the exciting news for Kansas, I guess if you want to develop wind, is Kansas is ranked number two in the whole country for wind potential. So the National Renewable Energy Lab looked at the potential to develop wind capacity in Kansas, and Kansas is number two. That's 90 times Kansas' current electricity needs. So you could become a net exporter of wind if you wanted to to other states. And one of the things about Kansas is that it's in the eastern interconnect. So it has transmission that could go to uh, cities in the eastern part of the United States that need power. OK, this is, this is just a little plug for my book, the cover of the book. But also just to tell you that in the book I have charts. I have a website, so you can get all the graphics from the book for free in there and other links. Um, there are four ways, basically, that wind is developed. Um, terrestrial utility scale, so that means on the land as opposed to off, offshore, um, and, and large scale. Private distributed wind, so on different people's farms or on rooftops, public lands, and offshore. And basically, I'm going to be focusing today on just the terrestrial utility scale, because that's where most of the wind capacity is developed in the United States right now. We still haven't had a single offshore wind turbine installed in the United States. But we're maybe getting there. OK, so here again is a map of Kansas with uh, the projects that are already here. And this is available from the Kansas legislature website. Um, and what does it do? I, I started, as I said, with economics. So they say about um, 4,000 to 5,000 direct and indirect jobs come from wind of power, and Kansas is now number five for wind-related jobs. So a lot of economic development while you're building the wind farm. Lease payments to landowners, so even once it's up there, those who are have a wind farm are getting regular lease payments. And that also increases the tax base, so there's capital investment of over $5 billion and annual lease payments of uh, $7.9 billion. Um, so again, here's a map with showing different developments in Kansas. The, the green triangles are those operating, the, the blue ones are under construction, and then the red are proposed. And if you're, if you're uh, in a local area and you want to try to calculate the economic benefits that you would get from wind, the National Renewable Energy Lab has the, what they call the JEDI model, but it means Jobs and Economic Development Impact Model. Okay, so you can go on site and you know try to figure out the actual calculation. So um, I'm actually just make sure I don't run out of time here. Um, so you have, as I mentioned, the direct jobs. Those are people that are actually working on the wind farm. You have indirect farms, so blade manufacturers, uh, parts, um, places that deal with. Uh, servicing the trucks and so on. And then you have induced impacts, they call it, so daycare centers or hospitals and things that come with the number of people that are added to an area. And this, again, um, is from the American Wind Energy Association. It shows specifically how you could look at this ripple effect in Kansas 
So payments to landowners, 2.7 million per year for every 1,000 megawatts of new wind development. Um, 2.9 million a year for increased tax revenue, construction phase jobs and operation phase jobs, and then all these indirect benefits. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to the environmental benefits. Um, good news for those of us who are in, in areas where water can be an issue. Um, I think Ogallala, as we mentioned earlier, I worked in Ogallala as a geologist, and you know, water depletion is an issue. Well, the good news for Wind is that it doesn't use water. Like most generation of electricity, you um, you flash the water into steam and it turns a turbine and then that creates electricity. Wind, you don't need that. The wind turns the turbine. So you don't have any water in the electricity generation process and you don't have any water in the development or anything else. Maybe you just a little bit deep dust down when you're, when you're building it. So. Um, 1,000 megawatts of wind saves 1,816 megawatts gallons of water in comparison to a conventional power plant. Also, if you're talking about fracking, um, then a fracking well can, can consume two to four million gallons of water. So if you're thinking about that as an alternative development, it's a, a water saver to go with, with wind. No air emissions, okay? So wind turbines don't burn anything, so there's no CO2 added to the air. 1,000 uh, megawatts of wind saves 3.2 million tons of CO2. And there are no toxic spills with wind. You know, I had a great slide, but I didn't have permission, so I was worried about posting it. But it's just a picture of someone saying the wind spill is now coming ashore, and basically all you have is a turbine blade, right? If you don't have oil and gas uh, uh, skims like you would have with the BP oil spill. Lee in Colorado had a flood, as you may have known, last year. And during that flood, uh, 48,000 gallons of oil was spilled. And it takes, you know, car carcinogens are in that oil. It's going to take many years, maybe decades, to actually get it all cleaned up. So uh, I talked to people in the wind turbine companies that were in the path of the flood. First of all, they weren't impacted because most of them were on higher ground. They told me even if the floodwaters had come there, they could have kept generating power because they're not actually, you know, um, they're not going to be, they could work underwater because you have to have steps to get into the turbines and they don't store any toxic materials at ground level except their small transformer that they have on the site and they, they burn that. Um, and you may also have heard of the coal fly ash that's built in North Carolina. So that's a product if you're using coal. So again, water consumption savings, wind power could save 5.6 metric tons of carbon dioxide. Okay, and then how many people know what a wind wake is? I hope this graphic shows you that uh, wind turbines actually have a, it's sort of like a boat, right? So after they've gone through, you have this uh, turbulence behind them. And I love this uh, photograph because it shows vividly what the wind can do, and this isn't ideal here because each turbine is impacting each one of those downwind, so it means they're not getting as much power as they would. And this graphic isn't on the website because it's one of the illustrations in the book. Um, but the good news for farmers is that I've been working with some atmospheric scientists in Boulder, and they've done some research. They, they're saying that, you know, okay, we need to think about wind wakes and what the impact is, and that downwind, uh, there's sort of a, a shadow from the wind, but it causes war warming due to the wind farms. Well, they haven't done all of the research yet, but they think that that actually might be improving crop production downwind of wind farms, right? Because it keeps a flow of air going through that can kind of keep plants cooler, on, on hot days, keep it warmer on cold days so they don't freeze and actually evaporate dew or other moisture that could cause uh, fungi or mold to grow. So, you know, one of the things they're looking at is whether you actually get increased crops down the from the wind farm because of the wind wind. So those are environmental benefits. Okay, so what are some of the, the sad, bad news? Um, one of the concerns, of course, is wildlife. And one of the ones that this little book addresses and that you hear the most is bird deaths by collision. And, and actually people in the wind industry don't think that that's a big deal, although there was a recent settlement in Wyoming with Duke Energy because the Department of Justice sued them for a golden eagle death. 
um, number of golden rule deaths, not, not a whole lot, because they know better now than to cite wind farms along flight paths, and when they didn't know in early California. This, is, this background is actually at Altamont in California, which they made the big mistake of citing along the first flight path. Although I've taken, this is a photograph I've taken, I haven't been able to find, take any where there were birds, but I know there are birds there. But the number of birds that are, you know, killed by wind turbines is so small in this study that was done by the USDA Forest Service, um, it just pales in comparison to the number of birds that are killed running into buildings or even cats. Um, and, and actually, there are groups that say that this estimate of cats is, is there's about 100,000 a year, but that that's low. They think maybe half, half of billion, hundred, hundred thousand, yeah, that, that 500,000 a year are killed by cats, and actually that's low in the cubic barrel cats. So, you know, in the whole scheme of things, wind turbines aren't that bad for, uh, you know, bird deaths. I'm not, I don't have time today to talk about bats, because that's, that's another possible issue. But they are working on it, they're trying to figure out technologies to either flash or send out noises to try to get animals away and consider the flight path. But the bigger issue, it seems to me, in Kansas is some of the, the land species, right? So the Lester Prairie chicken actually is a population, its population dropped by one half in 2012. So, you know, estimates are that there are only 37,000 of those birds remaining and that very likely it will be put on the endangered species list possibly next month. So be watching your newspapers. If it does, it will not only impact wind farms, but it will impact all other development because other development causes it. So this is the original range of the prairie chicken. And you can see that, you know, it's, Kansas seems to be home for them now. And if you remember the maps, and I'll show you, well, I'll show it again, um, that, you know, it's, it's traffic, pipelines, overhead transmission, but it fragments their habitat, and they also are concerned about uh, the shadow looking at like a predator flying over that kind of thing. So it definitely impacts the prairie chicken and the fact that we were going to develop significant amounts of wind in these areas where the prairie chicken habitat is was the reason that this study was done. So if you remember this map, I mean, going back to this one, you can see that in southwestern Kansas is prairie chicken habitat and in southwestern Kansas is some of the best wind resource. And some of the earlier slides I had show that the wind is being developed along some of those same areas. So again, here's the prairie chicken overlap with, with uh, wind. So what are they doing? The five federal agencies came together to try to put together a program to deal with the habitat issues. Those state wildlife agencies were looking at it. And the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies had a working group that put that together. So I don't know if, if anybody here in the audience was actually the University of Kansas developed this crucial habitat assessment tool. Is anybody? We don't have any experts here. Okay. Too bad you could have asked them questions. I'm not an expert on this, but I know that what they've done is try to identify how to protect habitat, and they also created a mitigation program. The problem is that the amount that they recommend for mitigation if you want to put up a wind turf wind tower is over a million dollars and over a million dollars per tower for mitigation is going to be probably cost prohibitive so and then even you know transmission a million dollars they did look at roads uh, oil and gas pads a hundred thousand probably something that they could more easily manage as far as part of their cost structure, but I think for wind turbines it's going to be more difficult because they have like a mile radius around the tower. So we haven't solved the lesser prairie chicken. If you see that it actually gets listed, then it will have impacts all, you know, not just Kansas. It'll go all the way, you know, up and down through wind country. The other thing is, uh, what about concerns conflicting development? And I, as I said, I used to be a geologist. I still am a geologist at heart. Uh, and if you look at conventional oil and gas lands, these are showing some of those. Of course, this is right in there. And if you look at this wind map, I'd like to just sort of illustrate how oil and gas seems to, you know, have this strange coincidence 
with wind development, right? So there, there are bound to be some conflicts with the two uh, being developed in the same areas. Also, if this is unconventional development, there is still some in Kansas, and, and I think that uh, David Pierce is maybe going to talk about some other unconventional development in Kansas. It doesn't look like as many conflicts, but there are there is some more there. So, can you develop them both at the same time? Well, you know, even though wind development is compatible with grazing, with ranching, it's not as compatible with some other development because they are spaced, so you have, you know, rows of wind turbines that create kind of a fence if you're trying to do anything uh, that you have to cross. So, you know, you have rows and rows of the turbines. Um, you have underground, I call it spider webs of wires, right? Because every turbine has to be connected to the transformers and to the transmission lines because that's where the electricity is coming, right? You're generating the electricity in the nacelle or the top of the turbine, but that electricity then has to get into the grid, and so it's got to have all these wires connecting throughout. So again, no problem with someone who's developing those first few feet into a crop or heavy grazing, but not good news if somebody has to go deeper because they might have, uh, they might cross some of those wires and, and have problems with that. So you can't really mine in an area that is difficult to drill oil and gas in the areas. You also have transmission lines that. Um, you also have transmission lines that, you know, oil rigs would have to go under if the wind project comes first. Sometimes if they have to do a seismic study, they'll say, well, we want the wind turbines turned off because all of that activity is going to change the seismic footprint. So the question usually is, you know, who can tell whom to shut off the wind turbines or who pays for that, right? So which one comes first? Um, and then there are a lot of impacts on surface views. Um, you have wider roads when they're putting the turbines in. They, they have what they call lay down yards. Have, have anybody seen them? Oops, seen the turbines coming on trains or anything? So they're, they're pretty big and they're getting bigger because they're figuring out that they can put them farther apart, get up into higher winds that's more regular. So maybe that's, that's good news, but it means that a lot of space on the ground is going to coming up. Um, and then the you know transmission line areas. So you have inevitably, if other developments coming in, and maybe conventional fuels had the benefit in the past of just saying, oh, we we're used to just coming in, having a minor impact on farming or something, and then going out. Now we have to work with this this wind company that's that's here. And so uh, I have written an article several years ago, published in Washburn about maybe we shouldn't allow severance of wind. So, you know, uh, again, how many people know what severance is? Okay, I need to explain that, I figured. Um, with, with minerals, they figured out that you could have a separate ownership of the mineral estate, you know, and, and the research I've done was kind of like, well, they thought the little trolls down there could mine that stuff without impacting the surface, so you might as well have two ownerships because there would be expertise of by someone who could develop the minerals as opposed to the people who would normally be uh, just farming the top, the land. Um, so they allowed two separate ownerships, but anybody that's done work in this area knows that that causes lots of problems down the road because the person who owns the surface, the farmer or rancher, doesn't get to have any say if an oil and gas company comes in and says, we have a property right under your property and we're just gonna come in there and get it, right? They're the dominant state. They get to come in and do whatever they need to get that resource out. Um, well, so people were doing that with wind too. They were saying, okay, we're gonna sell the wind. So someone has a separate property right in the mineral, somebody else has a property right in the wind, and then that surface owner doesn't get either. They don't get any royalties, they don't get to say how you develop them. So it was causing a lot of trouble. So um, we were arguing, well, based on, you know, I have a new article called about sins of the father. So based on the problems we've had with mineral severance, maybe we shouldn't be severing wind. So I guess we were convincing because several states banned wind severance, including Kansas in 2011. Um, and so we banned it, but the bad news is that now some people are saying, okay, well you can't really develop the wind, that they're a lower priority than oil and gas. And, and I would argue just because there's a different ownership structure doesn't mean that we should 
make oil our conventional uh, resources the dominant estate over wind development because you the, the thought behind severance was that it was worthless without being able to get to it and it benefited society to develop this resource. So hopefully we can get down the road where we can have multiple development, but you know we're gonna see how that all sorts out. And in, in the last minute that I guess I have, I just want to talk about how the price of wind has been coming down and um, the development of wind has been coming up and down. <coughs> Some of you may have heard that the reason it goes up and down so much is because the federal government can't figure out the tax structure that they want to impose on wind. So they have this thing called the production tax credit, oil and gas has tax credits. But the wind one keeps having to be renewed, and then it's not renewed. And so that's why you have record wind development in 2012, because the production tax credit was not renewed in 2013. A lot of people were worried about that. So they were trying to get in under the wire. So, and they're, they're right now, we're not sure that that production tax credit is going to get renewed. So we'll just see what happens to wind down the road without a little bit of consistency, not even if you call it a subsidy, I would just say consistency and uh, knowing whether the investment is something that you know you will be able to recoup at a certain rate, which other more conventional sources have had that benefit for over 100 years. What's the oil and gas guy doing here talking about sustainability? Uh, I'm going to take this uh, kind of more micro level to kind of look at what's going on here in Kansas and some of the issues, uh, particularly some of the issues that KK brought up. And uh, I know not even, not only am I the oil and gas guy, but I got a bunch of cats at home too. So this is <laughs> <laughs> on that. So anyway, I. Uh, First thing KK talked about sort of developing the, the renaissance of wind as a, as a major energy source. And I think uh, I want to start out with some of the realities of, of oil and gas and the, and the source of the, the, uh, the function of fossil fuels in the coming years. Uh, we are, this is a mining operation. It is the definition of an unsustainable activity because you're basically going in and extracting a mineral resource that took millions of years to form and we're basically bringing it to the surface and using it in a matter of decades. Uh, but, um, and because of that, because it's a fossil fuel, because of climate change concerns, it is definitely not a preferred source, particularly with the environmental community. And I think it's probably safe to say that the level of fossil fuel development including oil and gas that the environmental community would accept, ideally, would be zero. And uh, that's why the alternatives are uh, some of the, uh, why there's so much interest in getting the alternatives online as fast as possible. But I, I think uh, we can safely say that oil and gas, absent some major dramatic energy technological development, will continue to be with us into the 21st century. And really, the, the worst thing that happened to the environmental community in recent years happened within the past five years. And that was the discovery of huge new supplies of oil and natural gas that can be extracted from shale formations that previously were known to exist, but nobody could figure out a way to economically extract the oil and gas from it. So you had, uh, if, again, this is not any big discovery of Prudhoe Bay or something, everybody knew it was there. Yeah, but it was a combination of uh, horizontal drilling, drilling down into the formation and then going sideways into the formation, and hydraulic fracturing, combining those two, because the rock structures in shale are very tight. Uh, unlike conventional sources of oil and gas, which are in a coarse and permeable rock structure where you've got spaces between those rock grains, and then you have the ability of those spaces to be interconnected, so that you, when you drill into it, you're able to influence a larger area. Well, you just couldn't do that with the shales until you were able to get into the shale and then go those long distances. However, it has been a great benefit to the U.S. economy and uh, to U.S. foreign policy because uh, all of a sudden uh, we're not dependent upon Middle Eastern countries the way we were just a few years ago. And this is 
that, that's probably the most dramatic thing about this. In 2005, or I'd say 2008, we were talking about, I mean, wind was one of the major things that you would talk about when you talk about wind was kind of the, the, the dwindling horizon of the oil and gas supply. And it was, you know, it was within decades. And now we're talking about pushing that out for another hundred years. And that creates problems for the alternatives because uh, even though the prices for, for example, oil right now are, are relatively high, the price for gas is relatively low. And uh, that creates uh, a lot of competition uh, for development of alternatives. Um, the, uh, the goal, I think, is once we accept the, the concept uh, that yes, oil and gas are going to be a major part of the, of the energy mix in the next several decades, then I think the, the issue then becomes what's the best way to uh, make this as sustainable as we possibly can. And essentially we're looking at ways to efficiently develop the oil and gas uh, and by addressing those known inefficiencies, and there, there are several, there's several that the oil and gas industry has been addressing since the 1920s. Um, plan to minimize impacts, uh, plan to internalize those avoidable externalities, and, and also I think the other thing we have to do in the oil and gas industry uh, is plan for the inevitable. And the inevitable is, we know that in any particular area where you develop that resource, uh, it's going to gradually go away. You're going to mine it all out, and it's not going to be there anymore. Uh, the Hugo Reservoir is in a state of decline at this point in time, and, and uh, uh, other developments there have helped uh, boost that a little bit, but it's still there. The other, I think, much more major issue concerning sustainability <coughs> is what happens if the price of oil is one third what it is today. And believe me, it can happen in a week, a month, a year. Uh, and we could be looking at $35 a barrel oil, $30 a barrel oil. Uh, I remember I was teaching a business associations class one day, and I just threw it out. The price of oil is 140 bucks. I said, ah, don't worry about it. It'll be at 40 in August. And I didn't think anything about that at the time. That was I said that in April. And uh, several of my students started emailing me in August saying, how did you know? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot I even said it. You know, that's how that uh, But anyway. And that's, that's a real issue for sustainability, particularly when you stop and think that 8% of all the oil and gas that comes out of the ground in Kansas goes to the state of Kansas uh, in the form of severance taxes, and we make uh, determinations on budget and long-term uh, commitments based upon uh, that. So what I tried to do for this, I, I thought if I were going to look at the oil and gas industry in Kansas and try to come up with some sustainability principles what might those be? Uh, so principle number one is that oil and gas development should pay its way uh, by ensuring that those negative impacts, or those externalities are imposed upon, uh, they're imposed upon the public that uh, are internalized. And I think here we're looking for real and definable externalities impacting local communities that we that we can deal with. And I thought that I was, this morning I was uh, talking to Dr. Green and, and I thought, gosh, the externalities uh, extend beyond the state of Kansas, we are actually impacting the state of Wisconsin uh, because we engage in hydraulic fracturing in Kansas and we use a, a sand mixture, some sand material. It's a very specialized sand that will be propelled into the rock structure to hold those little fissures open. And it turns out that one of the major sources for that type of sand is in Wisconsin. And there have been literally uh, dozens or hundreds of mines that have opened up in that state uh, as a result of oil and gas development taking place in other areas. So the impacts are there. When's, when this all is over, and we got over 10,000 uh, unplugged wells in eastern Kansas. Uh, the oil industry began in this part of the state, uh, and uh, literally thousands of wells drilled. There were no spacing requirements. Uh, in fact, it was before they cased wells, a lot of time you drill with a cable tool rig, which basically means you can make a great big hole in the ground that's hard to fill with cement. And uh, we've been dealing with that in the state of Kansas for the past 30 years, and plugging those wells and funds and so forth for that. So that's one of the critical issues is we want to make sure, because when are the folks going to, when is it going to become uneconomic? An oil and gas lease, you have your rights as an oil and gas developer 
so long as the oil and gas is profitable to extract. Once that company meets that economic limit, then that lease is going to terminate. That's the way the industry is structured. And that property interest will go back to the landowner. And at that point in time, those wells have become uneconomic. And oftentimes, that might be consistent with a catastrophic price change. Uh, and when's the industry going to spend the money to plug those wells if it's at the time when it's of no economic value? And we've got some structures built into the state system there uh, as far as ensuring financial responsibility of uh, the operators. Uh, I think that's probably an area that needs some attention uh, to make sure that we're satisfied that, uh, that those funds will be there. Of course, the most important, uh, probably the most difficult problem, and this is what the industry would tell you, is that we've created funds through the years and, and made money available, but we have no guarantee that the state will not use that money for other purposes, which is one of the basic taxing issues that uh, we deal with here. And that's principle number two, that money collected from the oil and gas industry should be used to address the externalities that the affected communities. And one of the questions there is, are the fees or severance taxes getting their way, making their way back to the localities? Impact fees have been one of the things the industry promotes. One of the reasons is, is that it's associated with the final impact instead of giving the party, the state, a continuing revenue stream based upon the continued production of wealth, like you do under severance tax. The Kansas severance tax, for example, is 8% of the value of the oil or gas as it's extracted. So price goes up to $100 a barrel, their share of the tax revenue goes up. It goes down. To so you get the idea there. Where does that money go? Uh, in, the, in the article I go through in, in fairly great detail talking about where all the money goes once it goes to the state and how much of it comes back to the locality. We have a conservation fee fund in Kansas that is a tax on, on production for producers and part of that, that money is used to run all the regulatory program from the state of uh, from the Kansas Corporation Commission and also funds uh, some of the plugging funds that it's uh, the uh, severance tax. Uh, there's some exemptions there. The most notable is an exemption or a credit for ad valorem taxes. Uh, again, is uh, that 8%. We also have a county ad valorem tax, and um, uh, it's substantial. I think in 2012, the severance tax generated a little over $125 million in tax revenue to the state. The ad valorem tax generated about $225 million, so uh, a fairly substantial sum of money coming in there. And uh, you have those, those numbers set out there. Uh, compared to other states, if we were, uh, you know, this is one of the factors that folks that look at when deciding am I going to spend my drilling money in Kansas or Oklahoma or somewhere else, uh, is the, the tax burden. Because that's like having a, another revenue. Uh, partner involved in the development, and one of the issues for Kansas is there's about a 25% negative impact on the rate of return for investors uh, because of the, uh, the tax aspects, all other things being equal. But the other issue is going to be whether the money gets back to the impacted community, and, uh, and will it be used to address community impact, and will it be available at the time when the impacts occur? And I can tell you right now from everything I've looked at is the answer to those are probably no, well, sometimes, maybe, probably not. And uh, those, uh, that's one of the problems. Uh, the severance tax flow, 7% is paid to a county mineral production tax fund. That will go back. 50% is used for the general fund, 50% for the school district. Um, the other 12.41% uh, is this is the one sort of sustainability aspect of our tax law. They're creating kind of a rainy day fund that will last five years once the, once the thing, once their ad valorem tax revenues start to go into a negative level from where they've been, then they can draw upon this fund to supplement 20% of the fund available to it each year. Uh, so essentially you've got money going back into the severance tax that is then proportionately allocated back to the counties, at least to the tune of about 19%. Separate apart from that, though, you've got the ad valorem taxes being raised by the counties, which is exactly where 
the development is taking place. So those ad valorem taxes are based on the value of the oil and ground as well as the value of the facilities that are used to extract it. Uh, the well plugging, we got two well plugging funds, one for historic development. Uh, the first well was drilled around Paola in 1859, I believe. Uh, so that gives you an idea of how long the industry's been here. And then we've got another fund that's for uh, post-1996 development going forward. Uh, a big issue, I think, is are those funds keeping pace with the cost that we anticipate having to uh, incur at the point that uh, development is concluded? What about an impact fee? Pennsylvania recently enacted an impact fee which is designed to focus the money back on the local community. But if you look at that statute, you'll see that it's kind of become a Christmas tree for everybody. So not much of it, well, a lot of it goes out of the local community that's directly impacted by development. Um, another issue, and this is one that KK brought up, this idea about being able to sever mineral interest from surface interest, that really is a big problem. Uh, and I, I give this, uh, I do an oil and gas short course where we have a lot of international students and, and they come up afterwards and these are folks that have been in the industry and they, they look at it and they go, how do you ever get anything done in the United States? And the bottom line is, is we can pretty well split up property any way we can dream up. If you can describe it in a, in a document, then it can be split up that way. Uh, KK noted the one limitation on the on the wind aspects, and I think she makes the, the best case for not splitting that. A lot of people have said don't do it, but they really haven't articulated what I think would be a, a, a sound reason for giving up that freedom of being able to divide it up the way you want. KK focused on this, the only person that really has the ability to marshal the, uh, the relationship between wind oil and gas and everything else, agriculture, everything else that's going on out there is the landowner. And if that landowner isn't able to do that because they've given the minerals to somebody over here, they've given the wind over here, then they're just kind of stuck in the middle. And uh, at least this way at the time, if they're properly uh, advised by council, uh, when the wind folks come to talk to them, when the oil and gas folks come to talk to them, one of the things they're going to do is to make sure that they retain some authority to authorize other competing uses in the future with that property. And uh, that may be difficult to do sometimes. It may be a matter of stacking more money on the desk to, to <coughs> solve that problem for the, for the developer, but at least they have it within their power to do that. It's not some third party living in California that has the mineral rights uh, that is going to deal with it. The thing about splitting mineral rights, most of the folks that split the mineral rights are farmers, landowners, because they know that there's been development in the area and they're getting ready to give up their property and they think, well, gee, I want to keep a piece of the action just in case. I don't want to look like a fool if I sell the farm for $10,000 and it's worth a million. And the same issue came up after they passed the wind severance limitations in Kansas for farmers. They didn't want to sell their land because they wanted to try to retain some of the wind rights. And one of the solutions to that that I suggested was to come up with a royalty type provision where they could share in the revenue that might be created in the future but not have any of the executive or leasing or development rights that are associated with it. Another model from the oil and gas industry that uh, is probably not perfect, but it's there. This is, uh, this is something where the industry is probably going to get a rail out here and run me out here in a minute, but here it is. Uh, surface use. There's nothing more hapless than a severed surface zone. If you sever the mineral, if you grant the minerals to somebody else and you retain the surface interest, by conveying those minerals, and for those of you in property, you, you studied it as the easement by necessity, I've just given somebody a right in property that the only way I can get to it is from the surface. So there's the implied right to make reasonable use of the surface to access those minerals unless you explicitly address it and limit it in the deed that created severance. 99% of the time, that's not addressed. Uh, so there is an implied right to make reasonable use of the surface to get the minerals. That's why the folks were going nuts in Pennsylvania, because they lived on farms 
been through several generations, a hundred years without any oil and gas development, but back in 1890-something, somebody had conveyed out the mineral interest. And nobody was interested in it until 2005 when the Marcellus Shell came along and all of a sudden, we're here, we're here to drill a well, it's going to consume about 10 acres of your, you know, 12 acre track there and get out of what? Uh, because we've got an easement right to access that, that property. So I, I, I'm, I think after dealing with surface owners in that situation, maybe the best way to deal with those situations where they're already severed is to just give them a little piece of the action so that when all that disruption's taking place there, at least they've got, uh, uh, they've got some interest in it. Right there. The other um, uh, local government regulation or authority should be well defined. And I, I think it, it is pretty well defined in Kansas. Uh, we have municipal home rule, uh, constitutional based, uh, state constitutional based home rule, ability to regulate by adopting rule laws that do not conflict with state laws that are uniformly applicable to all cities. So you've got to have a uniformly applicable to all cities uh, in order for you to basically preempt uh, local regulations. Counties have much more limited authority uh, and the this 19101 and the Billy Oil case are good examples of uh, basically the legislature coming in and taking away authority for the counties to regulate in areas where they're already controlled by the Kansas Corporation Commission, the Kansas Department of Government. Uh, so, county authority. No, most of the most of the other sort of secondary regulation would take care take place at the county level otherwise because within the municipalities they're going to be able to zone they're going to be able to engage in uh, much more i think uh, focused uh, regulation than you are at the county level and uh, you know if you want to look at some of the county zoning authority uh, for those of you that haven't seen the zimmerman versus labunsi county it basically zoned out any commercial wind development within the county. So that's, that can be a two-edged sword sometimes. Uh, Pennsylvania, I just, I'll leave this case to you, it's the Environmental Rights Amendment, where they found a state constitutional basis that would restrict the state's ability to limit local government's ability to regulate to protect the environment. And it all focused on oil and gas development, oil and gas bans, and uh, that's kind of, and got everybody excited in Pennsylvania and the rest of the country. Several states adopted these environmental rights amendments, and, and at the time they thought, well, it sounded real kind of high sounding 1970s stuff. It can't do any harm, kind of like the National Environmental Policy Act was very, you know, sort of just kind of high sounding things. Yeah, the federal government would consider environmental issues when they make decisions. Well, it's turned out to be quite different for the past uh, 40, 50 years. Now. The last thing I want to talk about, I got a few other things here, but let me just, I want to go back to uh, uh, and follow up with KK, because I know one of the things you wanted me to address was this sort of conflict issue. I go into great detail in the paper talking about <clears throat> some of the uh, cases in Kansas. And I think really in this area, uh, wind development and oil and gas development are always going to be material uh, interference with one another. So that means you're going to have to do it by agreement. Uh, if you cannot agree, then it's going to be the first in time because the second person coming along that wants to do things on that property that interferes with your prior easement is going to be enjoined. And uh, we, we have not developed an accommodation doctrine in Kansas, but even those states that have accommodation doctrines, they were built around the farmer model, where if I want to irrigate and you want to develop oil and gas, then I'm going to be able to irrigate. And by the way, you may have to actually pay to accommodate my irrigation. That's the accommodation doctrine principle that came down from Texas of all places. Um, that's not the accommodation doctrine I think you'll see addressed in most places. Restatement third of property servitudes, and I talked about this in the paper as well, uh, has a very limited accommodation doctrine when you can do so without interfering with the existing use. But in those situations, the party seeking accommodation has to pay for the disruption. Just the opposite of what the accommodation doctrine of Texas is. And you stop thinking. If we're talking about competing commercial activities, then probably the person that wants the one to cut back on their rights ought to be the one that pays. 
and uh, we'll see that develop. But lots of hand wringing in that area, and I think basically it's going to be based on easement uh, Oil and gas, when I write to develop, it's right to come on and use the property to do so. Thank you.
or porous carbon, uh, or soil carbon, we'd have never had Darwin. The slack that was made available for the British to put a naturalist on board at that part in the age of exploration. Um, and also, John Brown was getting traction. The industrial north had a lot of coal. The agrarian south running more on contemporary sunlight. There was some coal around Birmingham. But the defeat was decisive because of the density of the carbon available and the throughput driven by the 3.45 billion year imperative. And so the hard-headed realist is constantly reminding us of um, that's the way we are. And in my view, if we don't deal with that problem and learn to practice restraint, uh, then we're going to get where we're headed. So with that in mind, uh, I want to I want to give a parable. Um, the word parable comes from parabolic, the Greek and the parabolic, well, like the uh, uh, the arch in St. Louis is a parabola, and with a parabola you come back to a common plane. Um, you could have a hyperbolic, and that's the origin of the word hyperbole, where things are going out. Well, I want us to think about the necessity for the hyperbolic, because I think we have a problem when we have, we're limited by the parabolic. I'll give you an example. Lots of men get prostate cancer. And they get surgery. And they may go for nine or ten years. Some of them, the surgeon gets it all. <coughs> they go for nine or ten years, but it comes back. And your urologist will tell the person it's out there. But there's some things we can do. We can treat with radiation. Or we can give you a shot that will shut down the pituitary and uh, no more testosterone for the cancerous cell that's eager for that energy rich carbon uh, to operate. And you may even go 20 years and die of some, uh, something else. But it's palliative. It's palliative. And that's what we're confronted with now, is the palliative to keep things going, even though we know the destructive power. So this conference, this gathering, has to do with the modern economy, that is, what rural communities need to do to survive in the modern economy. Well, that's dealing with a, with a parable. And uh, the modern economy will change. And at that point, when it's changed, will it any longer be modern? And it will, be, will it be the consequence of what we do now? Or will it be the business as usual as a result of the 3.45 billion year imperative? That's the question that goes beyond the available answer, and therefore, the right question. So, um, how fast and uh, how? And so the big question comes, how do we meet bona fide human needs without economic growth and the necessity to go negative? The history of Homo sapiens has been dependent upon growth. 
either the expansion of the use of carbon, the expansion in landscape, to the point that almost every utterance coming out of, <clears throat> whether it's not just the bookkeepers of business or the politicians, it's the family farm, is how can I have economic growth? Because that's the only way we've solved problems. In other words, the etiology of the cancer cell which is growth for the sake of growth. So what do you do when you have these realities that you're confronting and at the same time, <clears throat> this is what seems to be doing the sin? Well, <clears throat> I'm interested in agriculture. And my view is if we can keep ourselves fed, we might be able to work our way through uh, this long tunnel that we're involved with, that we're in. in. Um, so, what's the matter? Are you afraid that they can't hear me? No, oh. Uh, all right. The, um, I want to tell you why farmers are having a hard time in this world. Farmers deal with the low density carbon. And high density carbon people are the ones that call the shots. So farmers have no depreciation schedule, even though the quality of the farm soils may be declining. They have seasonal cycles and weather plus weeds and insects and pathogens that relentlessly confront them. They have no labor pool sitting around ready for beck and call. Only so many crops can be grown in a season. And when there's a temptation to double up on crops, farmers know it's risky. Capital has a hard time penetrating the farming part to the farmer's advantage because the farmer doesn't have control. It would be nice to have from farming a fixed income, a pension, get paid even if injured or otherwise disabled. And while farmers turn inputs into crops, such as corn, wheat, soybeans, vegetables, animals, the various inputs, such as machinery, seeds, fertilizer, pesticides, have to come from somewhere else. So lots of money is made by the suppliers of such, and farmers have, all, have the risks. Well, there is crop insurance, and it is subsidized. Uh, <clears throat> farmers have little to say when it comes time to sell their harvest and market it, and they need transportation to get their crops there. Processing is necessary to make many of the products fit for the consumer, and farmers are not likely to control that. And in spite of all these obstacles, there are people that want to farm. And who are they? Uh, how is it that they're willing to make themselves so vulnerable in a world where power is directly proportional to the density and quantity of the carbon that's available? And who has access to that power that's embedded within the lumps has undue political power. So if we're to think about um, correcting this course that we find ourselves on, we now find entering into the picture what I think is the worst form of fundamentalism uh, at work in the world today. And it's not, it's not the fundamentalism of the 
various churches or the denominations or any of that. It's a fundamentalism that comes with the milk. And as I see it, the technological fundamentalist. That we're going to solve our problems through technology rather than to think about how we're going to exercise restraint and have mutual coercion, mutually agreed on, and have something like rationing. The R word. One of my colleagues, uh, Stan Cox, plant breeders, written a book called Any Way You Slice It, The Past, Present, and Future of Rationing. So we have the technological fundamentalist that says, well, we will think of something. But the thinking of the something has always had a fairly large density of carbon standing behind it. Um, we had wind machines up at the land when we first started in 76. And uh, I'm in favor of wind machines, but I do have to ask, uh, what about the scaffolding of civilization that stands behind those wind machines? And the embodied energy that goes into it, and so on. I mean, we had a 10-year study called the Sunshine Farm, in which we had the biodiesel tractor, we had photovoltaic panels, we had two five-year rotations, we had 50 acres in cropland, we grew the fuel, we went all the way back to the energy costs for mining the ore in the Minnesota Iron Range uh, to build the tractor and processing in Gary, Indiana, and so on. You bring a one-pound bolt home, and you put it on a scale, and you get the estimate of the embodied energy. <clears throat> well, we found you can go through about three layers, but at some point, you, it's just splinters into uh, unable to do a full cost accounting and that is the biggest chunk and it's civilization that's in place that also is going to experience the second law of thermodynamics it's also going to wear out so these are some questions that we've got to put into our thinking as we think through uh, the solution coming through technological fundamentalism. What we're about uh, at the Land Institute, how much time did I have? I'm a senile rapture. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to know how much time I have. Six minutes, okay. I'm not going to show you any slides then. Uh, <laughs> So, I want to talk about a little bit what the technological fundamentalist is now proposing for agriculture. Uh, and it comes right out of the Green Revolution era. And I was a graduate student, I finished in 66 in the genetics department, and a lot of my buddies went off to help make that Green Revolution. We were all gung-ho, we were going to be heroic, and by golly, they got double and triple yields out of our, well, the top three crops is, number one is rice, number two is wheat, number three is corn, and what were their unspoken as well as spoken assumptions? Low productivity is the problem. Got to do something about low productivity. Now, soil degradation was factored in as, as a cost in their input-output ratio emphasis. There was a gap between the social and the scientific. There were the old world diseases which came with conquest, irrigation problems, soil problems, and more. But this gap between the social and the scientific was more or less ignored. And as a consequence, we have a suicide rate in India due to pesticides is huge. Uh, tech, 
traditional techniques are more of an obstacle than a resource, was that assumption. Now I'm telling you this because these are the assumptions we're carrying now on what we're going to do about food for the future. Uh, we are the teachers, they are the learners. Fold three, agriculture is not vitally linked to wild nature. Well, if the world was monoculture corn, we would have collapse. Technologies are neutral. When persuasion fails, it's time to use compulsion. And agriculture is to serve as an instrument to achieve industrialization. In other words, adoption of the Green Revolution package is essential. You need more chemicals, build a chemical plant. All right, so what, what do we have as an alternative to think about now? I try not to use the word worldview. When somebody uses that term, I look for a cop to go take my nap. <laughs> uh, but, or paradigm shift, or whatever. We all are tired of those terms. But we do have to think about how we're going to be doing our business in a world with climate change, and in a world with declining resources, in a world with the, act, uh, the, the oceans becoming more acidic, in a world in which rainforest is being torn down in order to plant soybeans, in a world in which, and in which, and in which, as a result of this rapacious work at seven billion, and the language of the industrial hero, we must feed the world, rather than ask the question, how is the world to be fed? And the world needs fed. So, what do we have available? Well, we have the only true economies that exist on the planet. And those are nature's economies, prairies, rainforests, alpine meadows, and so on, desert scrub. These, they feature material recycling. They run on contemporary sunlight. What our work is about is acknowledging that the agriculture featuring annual grains, which is some 70% of our acres, uh, devoted to some 70% of our calories worldwide, and pretty close to that in the U.S., is, stands behind soil erosion and a major contributor to greenhouse gases. In fact, land use is number two as a source of greenhouse gases, ranking behind power plants and ahead of all transportation. And yet, it's given so little attention. Now, some of that's due to deforestation, but if you even partition that out from deforestation uh, that's devoted to agriculture, it's about equal to all transportation. So the production of the 70% of our calories comes in at about 14%. So, if we could build an agriculture based on the way nature's ecosystems work, like the prairie, because we're primarily grass seed eaters and secondarily legume seed eaters, we could make the fastest major contribution to the reduction of the greenhouse gases. So we're mostly plant breeders perennializing the major crops to be grown in mixtures and building domestic prairies. Now, we're using computers, we do molecular markers, we have tractors, we have pickups, we have combines, we have discs, we're doing all of the things that contribute to the problem. The question is, when you get to the other side, and you have, we have the new species and the new varieties, Will they be dependent upon what got them there? And our answer is no. They will be available even to a Stone Age uh, farmer. The industrial world can't say that. Whether it's for making wind machines or solar collectors or whatever. The scaffolding of civilization is so dependent upon that highly dense uh, carbon. So, 
But if we can imagine trying to get agriculture since the, I think the fall began with agriculture. Don't worry, I'm an evolutionary biologist. <laughs> but the biblical fall uh, began with agriculture. Then it seems fitting that we can begin the journey to bring ecology as a worldview to not only inform a research agenda in agriculture, because it's like bringing different hardware. With the perennial, you have different hardware because it stays there year round. And you're harvesting and not just plowing up every year. Then we can begin to find a new source of metaphors for our ordinary daily living and put begin that journey to put the industrial mind behind as we bring on an ecological worldview. Uh, well, that's all I have to say for now. <laughs>
uh, industrial development for the mere purchase, that purpose of having jobs and save the land around and do that through um, putting restrictions on development and even buy up land as a community for the purpose of allowing, whether it's gardeners or small farmers, to have land that could then produce food that could be eaten locally and more healthfully and so on. In other words, do anything to validate land as a source of food production above all else. Put that as number one priority. And that will take tax dollars being spent by communities, but subsidized resilience instead of economic growth. And acknowledge that growth ultimately is going to cost. It's going to cost. Next question. <laughs> How much, uh, Professor Pierce mentioned the, this frac fracking, it was, was the new technology. Uh, and, and, and from your perspective, with, uh, Dr. Jackson, that's kind of another cocaine hit where we, we are all dependent upon cheap oil. So for all of you, how has this fracking hurt the development of uh, less intrusive sources of energy and environmental farming? Well, I would say that fracking, uh, fracking is not something that causes a problem. The problem that you have with energy is that probably the discovery of large amounts of energy that may limit your choices because of that, because you have large amounts of energy that causes prices to be competitive and things of that sort. I don't view fracking as being a problem. Uh, I wasn't I, my yeah, and and so I, I mean, and I think that's that's part of I think part of the problem is is that fracking is is a is something that you can use if you want to try to prevent development, and it's been very effective. So, but it doesn't tell you how development should be done in order to manage these sorts of problems with community impacts and so forth. Um, and you know, I. I know we've we've talked about the fracking issue in Kansas a lot. Uh, uh, we we did start fracking in Kansas, 1947. Uh, it's been done for years. Uh, granted, not in the horizontal setting, but uh, I, I think fracking to me has been more of a device to use to try to prevent development as opposed to worrying about how should we go about development in order to be controlling the, the negative. I just wanted to be sure that well, my point was the development of greater amounts of cheap energy. How it's had that the impact of that on these up alternatives? Huge, huge. Yeah, I, I think the United States has had a history of being like a dog that just gets distracted by squirrel. Squirrel, you know, basically, as the price of oil goes down, it's like oil, oil. That's our answer. So. I've worked with a number of people at the National Renewable Energy Lab and back in the 80s when the price of oil was high, we were all focusing on developing in a you know, reasonable manner toward renewable fuels and then as soon as the price of oil went down, that's the, save, the saving grace, we don't need to think about this. And actually, they um, are crying over there because they said other countries continued. You know, like in Denmark, they just kept the price high for oil, and then any difference between the market price and the price they were charging at the pump, they, they put back into funds to uh, fund renewable energy. So they, they have become the world leader in wind turbines. Um, Germany took our energy efficiency, they took our solar technology, so now Germany's <coughs> one of us in these things, and if we had just continued on that path, then we could be the world leaders, and instead we just get distracted again. So the price the cheap natural gas has made it much more challenging to keep moving forward. Renewables are keep going down. The price is going to continue to go down. And they're in places already, a crossover, where they're, they're more economic than other things. But the fact that you have this sort of very low price makes it more challenging to get those new technologies off the ground.
I'll use apparel. <laughs> <laughs> there was a study done that went for at least 10 years, and it might have been longer. There were 10 Petri dishes in which um, bacteria were introduced. The same species of bacteria and the same species, uh, the same kind of antibiotic. They played it like we'll have one through ten. As the petri dish filled up, they would transfer that genotype to another petri dish with the same um, antibiotic. It ran for ten years. They all of course, had developed resistance to the antibiotic, all 10 of them. But the pathways, the genetic pathways, were all different. So we keep talking about different ways to operate on in an economy that is nothing more than petri dish economics. We're very good at developing abstractions. And we note that some people are moving faster on the petri dish than others, so we put in regulation in the interest of social justice, but so we can all get to the edge at the same time. We're not dealing with the fundamental problem, <laughs> and that is growth. And how do we live within our means? Our bodies stop growing, well, <laughs> in a way. <laughs> but this doesn't stop growing. And in fact, life tends to get better. But we only think that we're going to get better if we get more. And I think the Petri dish example is fundamentally, fundamental throughout, uh, throughout animal and plant life, that we will find a way. Some of our germplasm out there responds to different environments. The, the Kernza that we developed at the land yields better in Minnesota. So there are different ways that things are going to happen, but the net product is going to be the same. You see, uh, maybe I should have used hyperbole. <laughs> <laughs> hey, with uh, without severance, what do the wind deals look like? Are they like an oil lease? Yeah, pretty much. Um, you just lease the wind, and and so it can just look like, uh, you know, a, a lease for someone that owned it. So you don't actually have a deed that's separate. And one of the things about severance is that if it's separate property, then when someone dies, it could go to all the heirs. And at least with a lease, you know who the lessor is and who the lessee is. So it's more concrete and it's got a set term instead of, you know, with the property estate, it just keeps severing and fractionalizing and so forth. Anyone else like to jump in with a question? Yeah, go ahead. Well, two parts of that. The first part is, are there communities that do that? Yes. And there's a whole website called Windustry that's dedicated to trying to give information to communities about how to do that. Um, 
I do think that there could be some questions about, you know, is it going to be harder and harder for communities? Because one of the hardest things for communities is trying to find a power purchase agreement with the utility for long term to make it work. And so there are challenges to it. So I, I don't actually know what the future might be. It might be harder for communities to do that. But on the other hand, uh, if developers are seeing resistance, then this is one way to get community buy-in. And so it's touted as a good tool for that. What are the wind turbine companies, what are their major considerations when they're going to build these turbines on these pilot lands? And I think you're not asking about the, the manufacturers, you're asking about the wind farm developers. Yes. Okay. Um, what are their primary concerns? That, well, first... I mean, other than the, the wind there. Right. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the, prog the progress, is basically you, you figure out, you try to get a land deal where you... Uh, get all of the land because if you have some holdouts that might be difficult um, You try to check the wind resource Then you have to get a lot of permits you have to get, deal with endangered species possibilities because as you know those apply to private land as well as to public land um, and Then you have to have the financing which is very challenging as I said without the production tax credit and with severance a lot of uh, people that were financing from Renewable companies a lot of them were from Europe and they just weren't used to the concept of severance at all So they would just walk away if you had severed rights because they didn't know how to deal with it So there are a lot of moving pieces as you can imagine It also in the oil and gas Conflict area that's a big issue because the, the, the agreement that you use the, that You go to get your financing with they'll evaluate all the, anything that might interrupt that and flow for the 20 year time frame that the financing is being obtained for. So, even a minor sort of issue about an oil and gas lease, what could somebody come in there and do, it, even though it's going to be for a short period of time, it can be magnified uh, so that that ends up being a major negative impact on your financing when you go to try to get somebody to, to buy into that project. Last question. Um, Steve? Um, yeah, I just had a quick question. You know, um, uh, California just announced that it was uh, thinking about running a, uh, basically starting a wind farm out of Wyoming um, and running a grid, uh, you know, all the way over there. I'm just curious if there's any discussion about doing anything like that in Kansas or if there's enough wind energy in this region or throughout the United States um, you know, to, get it, to get it to market to the coast, I presume. Yeah, that's a really interesting issue. Um, actually, it's Phil Anschutz's company that's developing in Wyoming, and they're building a private transmission line uh, to California, actually to Nevada, to the <coughs> California grid. And the uh, federal government's done studies about how climate change and storms may impact some of these transmission lines, but you know that's another issue. Is and wind is usually in a remote area, but it has to get to the population centers. So. Um, in, I mentioned briefly, and I didn't put that map up, but that we have three main interconnects in the United States. So we have the western interconnect that goes to California, we have the eastern interconnect that Kansas is in, and then Texas is pretty much its own, ERCOT. And those run on all different frequencies, so this is the transmission. And so uh, energy doesn't go across that very well, but that's what Kansas would be favorably, you know, in the area where there are eastern load centers. But I have not heard of any particular projects in Kansas that are targeted to go somewhere. Is anyone here familiar with the Green Line proposal on that? They're, yeah. They're, I think it's a seven uh, a DC line that they're wanting to build through Kansas to basically move Kansas wind energy to uh, the eastern part of the United States. Yeah, there's a clean lines energy proposing to build a DC line, basically. Missouri and Illinois. Both of them are trying to harvest all that, uh, all the wind and power out there. Because transmission is the biggest problem there. It's not there yet. And it, and it is a private way. I mean, it's a separate standalone uh, transmission. I can see Great Plains has already built two big transmission lines in Kansas. But again, the more transmission is definitely needed. I'm here.
expect the journal's request that we stop a little early for lunch. And thank you so much to our panel.